Hello, I'm Tony Hadland, and in April 2017, I visited John Emery at his home in the city of Bath to record his cycling reminiscences. John Emery is a cyclist who deserves to be better known. Born in the west of England during World War II, he began racing at the age of 16. By the time he was 21, he was training with the great Tommy Simpson in Flanders. Back in England, he had an illustrious racing career and retired from racing at the age of 29, having beaten the personal target of completing a 25-mile time trial in under an hour. But 11 years later, at the age of 40, John returned to cycling and raced as a veteran for another decade, clocking up 120,000 more miles on his bike. As a young man, John was also part of the team that developed the original F-Frame Moulton. He tested the prototypes and worked at Bradford-on-Avon alongside Alex Moulton, John Woodburn and others. This recording is in three sections, each of about half an hour's duration. The first part deals with John's early years, how he got into cycling and his time in Belgium with Tom Simpson. John, if you'd like to tell me a little bit, first of all, about your early life, because uh, I believe you had quite a traumatic start to your life, what with it being wartime. I have no memories of the war, uh, uh, because I was, I, I was that young. They were simply that I remember the war years being living in a, in a family of all women, because the men were away, and my grandmother had 13 children, nine girls, so it was women, women, women. <laughs> And, and of course, my what would be my cousins and, and a brother. My brother had uh, meningitis in about 1939-40, because he was about uh, 18 months older than me, and that left him with severe problems. He went deaf and other problems, but he's perfectly all right in, in, in other respects. Uh, as for the war, uh, the bombing was uh, probably not a highlight, but one of the big things that happened in Bath. Uh, and as I say, we used to be transported by pram and walking about three miles over the, what is now the Bath University fields, which wasn't there then, to the caves. And as I say, in the process of one of the evenings when we were going over, uh, a bomb dropped in, in a bar, near a barn where we were actually uh, trying to take some security and it blew the roof off. And the process went by that uh, when the bombing was over and they left the building, I was actually left in the rubble. But I always think they probably thought they should have left me there, but they, <laughs> they didn't. Um, other than that, I had a good... Uh, my, my childhood was, was memories of hot days, good friends, out in the road playing as you do cricket with the with the wickets drawn against the church wall under, underneath their lovely stained glass windows, which probably... <laughs> So these were in chalk, presumably chalked on. No, they were painted. Oh, painted. Oh, we actually ah. somebody actually painted the wickets on on the East End wall. It was great fun. It was all hot, sunny days, you know, with lots of climbing and scrambling. Uh, school was. I started very early. I started at three and a half because my brother was deemed a problem, uh, which didn't become fully aware of what it was until he was about five or six but i actually went to school with him so that i held his hand in in the infants so when we did something i took him uh -huh. and it wasn't until a new teacher came to the school and said to my mother do you think david might be deaf you know that's why he, you know deafness is obviously in a in a small child can be assumed to be a bit of stupidity yes and it, he was he wasn't stupid but obviously couldn't hear so that's why I started school at three and a half. I have to admit that it didn't, it was no, of no great benefit. <laughs> uh, from there, uh, we, we, we obviously, after the war, things were um, the, the usual thing of making by. I, for one reason or another, actually passed the 11 plus and, and became the first child or boy in our area to actually get to grammar school. Oh which upon looking back was probably one of the worst things that could have ever happened to me because grammar schools and me didn't fit. All of my friends obviously went to technical colleges or other environments, which I'm sure would have suited me being a practical person, whereas grammar school wasn't, I mean, Greek and Latin and 
I'm sorry, left me stone cold. <laughs> it was it, it was the school, obviously, where Roger Bannister went to during the war. Uh-huh. It, 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 that's where he was. Uh, so I was older then, but, uh, but he went there during the war. He didn't run his four-minute mile when he was there, of course. <laughs> that was Oxford. But uh, so that was our sort of a bit of glory, if you like, that Bannister went there. Um, and I... In the process of everything, I found I was useless at cricket. I was always stuck somewhere where either the ball was meant to hit me or it was so far away I wouldn't catch it. I was Rugby, I was a small lad, so I, I never really got into that. But one day, I suddenly found I liked cycling. And that's where my cycling world started. And at 13, I managed to persuade my father to allow me to purchase a new bicycle by doing a paper round, bought a BSA tour of Britain. Uh, and I think it was either in the same year, I was either 13 or I'm actually looking back, I may have been 14. I pick, I was reading the Cycling Weekly. It was the the magazine of choice. Could I find out in my local um, paper shop, one down on the counter. And so I, I ordered it and, and had it from then on. And I did my first 100 mile cycle ride on my own on a 62 inch fixed wheel gear because I transferred, I realized that gears were, it was fixed wheel. So I I had my, I changed my BSA Tour of Britain from eight gears to a single fixed wheel. I think it was like 62 inch. And I did my first 100 mile ride on my own. Nobody knew I was going. Wow. I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I, I just, the reason possibly for that was because my parents were in business. They, they ran a fish and chip shop. Ah. Which of course meant long hours, and I was always somewhere else. So I was very independent. Not I was I was looked after, but you know my life. So I just took off and did this hundred. And I remember coming back through Bristol on my way back towards Bath, absolutely shattered, and stopping in a transport calf and eating a great load of food. Then then tucking in behind a low loader lorry all the way back to Bath. So I did cheat a bit. I, I was <laughs> I was paced. Um, that from there I joined uh, the local cycling club. The, there were two clubs, the Bath Wheelers and the Bath Cycling Club. Now the Bath Cycling Club was the the, the creme de la creme, that was the racing boy. So I joined the Wheelers because I thought this is no good because I was, I was a youth hostler, I wasn't into racing. Well, of course I, I joined the Bath Wheelers, which looking back was just about hanging on. It, it was failing. I was one of the very few members that actually joined, I expect. So a neighbour of mine one day, uh, John, uh, lived at the back of where I lived, came over one day and said, you want to join a real cycling club, he said. So I, at 16, I transferred my allegiance to the Bath Cycling Club. Uh-huh. And from that, that was the start of my, what I call my real cycling, if you like, right. uh, because um, they, they were good. They, 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 they were... The wonderful thing, Tony, was that I know it sounds um, a bit sort of... How can I say it? I think we had the best days. These guys were all coming back from national service, no cars, everybody working, yeah. forty-eight hour a week. I mean, you know, people think forty-eight hours. That you know, you 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 didn't work Saturday for overtime. That 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 was the normal working week. And we used to do things like uh, the the lads as we were. There could be there were a good few of us around about the sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen bracket. We used to meet. Um, on a Saturday in the in the winter, we we some guys had to do well. We all worked Saturday morning, so we met sa- Saturday afternoon to ride to London, and we would cycle to London. Uh, all six or eight of us. How far is that? Hundred and ten miles. Uh huh. Something like that on a on a on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Said about five and a half hours. We you know we, we obviously very often with the west wind behind us, and uh, I remember the first time we actually stopped in Shepherd's Bush for accommodation because our our aim was to go to Ken Collier's Jazz Club. We were all into ah. traditional jazz. And one of our chaps knew he was a bit older than us and, and knew where Collier's was. So so the first time we went there we went to Ken Collier's Jazz Club. But uh, we then realized that our evening session finished at eleven. But of course there was an all night or they came out and you were <laughs> so the next time we went, not telling anybody that we were oh yes, we should we we've got accommodation book mum, you know, but we never did. <laughs> we literally came out, joined the queue and went back in for the all nighter and then came out and at six o'clock in the morning got on our bikes and rode home. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so that was our cycling and the annual tour, you know, to say to Barcelona was, was one year. Another year was to Killarney. Mm. And and of course the 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 men that we were because a lot of them were men. I mean, they, 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 uh, but no cars. So, so every if you had two bikes, you were posh. Yes. It, it, uh, and and it, you know you, you had one bike that sort of survived. But very often you as you developed your 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 old bike would become your training bike, and then you would have a, a racing bike, which was quite you were an elite, you're almost in the elite squad. My initial racing was less than hopeful. My first race was at 16 uh, in what we call a long markers event. And there were uh, 120, it was a full field. Even to get into the third category race, it was, it was a third category time trial, 25 miles. It was a full, and I got in. And I, I was 98th out of 120. So hard, many people, I think the general feeling was, well, I wouldn't bother if I was you. I don't know what it was. It, it never registered. Hmm. And within two years of joining the Bath Cycling Club, I won my first championship, Excellent. which which was a, a medium gear, a, a, you know, the old 72 inch, 48, 18 sprocket, 48 yeah. chainring, 18 sprocket, 72 inch. And I think the uh, the the local the the champion that was I'd been training with moved off to go to Agricultural College. Uh -huh. So so that year there was a a bit of a vacancy. Now I didn't. It didn't register, but somebody else was going to become the new champion. But I did. And you were what, 16? I, no, I was 18, 18 then. So I won my first club championship. And I think because I was quite keen on riding longer rides, I rode my, rode my first 100 mile time trial when I was 19 in the Welsh Championship and came sixth, which was quite, you know, over in Wales, was, was quite a, a good event. People started to sort of raise their eyebrows. And, then, and I think at 20, I wrote my first 12 hour, which was, ooh, you're far too young for that, you know. Yeah. And I came fourth to the national team champions that, of the best all rounder and 250 miles. Gosh. In my first, uh, totally good support. I mean, the people that were against me riding were the first people to come out and actually, so I got good support. And I think it was at that point, I didn't realize it, that there was a bit of talent showing. Mm. And then I, Things like, for instance, the 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 the, the squad opportunity to go to Ghent with Tom Simpson was advertised, and my uh, my uncle said to me, who was, who was dead keen. I mean, he was a merchant navy man, but when he was home on leave, said, "Are, are you going to apply, John?" Because we it was in. We were talking about it. I said, "No, I said, I can't afford that." I said, "I, you know, I, I hope they probably won't pick me." He said, "Look," he said, "if you if you get picked, he said, I'll pay." So I applied, you see, so I was working, I, I was actually at college. On the day I was at college, I rang home and I, I said to my father, I said, any, any letters come to you? Yes, he said, um, anything from, yes, he said, there's one from Belgium. And he'd opened it and, and, I, I, and I said, he, 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 he said, yeah, he said, you've got one. He said, and you're in. Mm -hmm. so, you, you, so you can imagine, <laughs> I was suddenly flying high. A lovely letter from Tom inviting me over and I, it was one of my treasures I wish I'd kept. It was a letter obviously poorly written. I mean, Tom was never going to be in the, in, 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 in that sort of field. But it was the last remark that I would love to have kept the letter. P.S. Please bring two pound of Wolves pork sausages. <laughs> and I said to my mother, what does that mean? And evidently, even though Belgium, and you can imagine, I all sorts of sausages in Belgium were, but they loved their Wolves pork sausages. Oh, right. So the whole squad, I don't know how many pounds of, of Wolves pork sausages we delivered on the day, but we did. <laughs> Racing was good. Uh, obviously, it was only a, a, a taster session. And our first event was a, was a, a Kermis in a place called Courtrai. Oh, yes. Well, you know Courtrai, mm -hmm. Tony. So the day arrived, so off we went with Tom and Fat Albert Bielrick, who was his mentor and whatnot, to, to ride in Courtrai. And we were absolute rubbish, <laughs> absolute rubbish. It was about a kilometre round circuit in Courtrai or whatever it was, all over cobbles, all sharp bends. Well, I mean, our bike handling compared to the Belgian was absolutely <laughs> appalling. There we were racing in the squad, in the, the field, and in front of us was a, an ice cream wagon with the back doors open, an ice cream van, and they were had a, a machine playing music, and it, it was Chubby Checker, Let's Twist Again. <laughs> so I always remember that piece of music. Anyway, when I finally came in, 
well defeated. I wasn't the only one. Nobody finished from our squad. Tom was quite amused, you see, and so I took my hat off, the bunch of bananas that we used to use, you know, the yeah, as was compulsory in Belgium, yeah. ch threw it on the ground, and Tom was, was laughing his head off at us, and, he, and I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you, you boys are trying to hang on to those Belgians, you see, and he saw great amusement. In the process, he broke my hat, the <laughs> strap. It might have been the hat wasn't that good, but anyway, the strap broke, I thought no more of it. So that, that night when I'd gone to bed at about 10 o'clock, I was um, less than amused. Got all, if it's going to be like this, we've got, we've got Ghent Vervelgum and the Tour of Flanders coming up <laughs> in the next two weeks. So um, I was just dozing off and I heard this voice saying, John, John. And I thought, am I dreaming? I thought, no, hang on, who's that? I went to the top of the stairs and at the bottom of the stairs, and of course, there was only two people there, me and Tom Simpson. And he was, he burst out laughing again. I said, and of course, I, I, I was almost asleep. I said, what are you laughing at now? He said, because humour was the whole thing with all the time with Tom. It, it was it was fun. I said, what are you laughing at now? I may have actually sworn, actually, but <laughs> I won't say that. He said, you? I said, why? And I hadn't realised it, but my, but my mother had given me a, a pair of paisley pyjamas. And, <laughs> and he was greatly amused. But... The important thing was he brought me a hat and he, it was the hat that he'd worn in Zandvoort when he came forth ah. in, in his first professional world road race. As you know, we, he came that uh, very, very close to a medal. Yes. And he, he, I, 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 was it Andre Daragad or whatever? It was a flat course in Zandvoort, which obviously suited Tom quite well, although he, although he did say to me he died a thousand deaths because the speed and whatnot. But that hat, he gave me the hat. In, wow. in, you know, which, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I gave it when I finished cycling in my late twenties. I gave it away to one of the lads. Yeah. They probably wouldn't have realised what it was. You know, we rode Ghent Vevogum. I think because we'd done so poorly in the Courtrai Kermis, I think that it inflamed us. And of course, this suited us. It was 110 miles and in, fa on, in fairly straight lines. We could ride in straight lines, <laughs> uphill and downhill, but we weren't particularly good. It was a good race. Uh, it was a thundering good race. I don't know how many were in it, but our numbers were in the 300. And it, I'm not saying that it, there were 300 riding, but our numbers for our squad were in the 300. Yeah. And I remember when this um, film actress or dropped the flag for us to go, I looked up and panicked because all I could see was it looked like hundreds of bodies pounding away. And I, I took the risk of looking over my shoulder and there were just as many behind me. I thought that wasn't too bad. But anyway, I forced my way to the front to, and we got onto the dual carriageway, which was closed, as you can imagine. And here we were within a few miles. I was at the front with about six of us going hell for a leather. And we'd all, already, I thought, and the, the BMW motorbike with the cameras were zooming up the side. And I suddenly thought to myself, hang on a minute, we've got a, over 100 miles to go yet. <laughs> so discretion, etc. So the race settled down and off we went. And it was a, it was a good race. And we, I could sense because, you see, we knew we did had no, no knowledge of the course whatsoever. We, we were literally follow the leader. And as we were coming down this slope, I, I sensed it. Something was something was afoot. You could sense it in in the field. And as we came down this into this village, it did a sharp, a very sharp left up, and that's what they were aiming for. And that really split the field. Yeah. And at that, and I was in the second bit, not the first bit, uh, because I obviously didn't realise what was going on. And I realised that unless you got back to that. Friend, the race was over, so I I put my head down and just counted. I just one two three one two three one two and just kept going until wheels appeared in my vision and I knew I'd got back. The rest didn't, and that was it over. And it was a good race. Uh, the in, the most interesting bit I think from our point of view was we came into the Ardennes and we were going up the side of the Ardennes and I thought we'd literally go up the top and round, but we didn't. As we got about three quarters of the way up up the hill. They did a sharp right onto a cobbled track oh. that went, literally, it could have, must have been one in five, one in six, cobbled with steep banks either side, no, no more than eight foot, ten foot wide, Gosh. with the cradle obviously where they were. And I remember 
the first thing I saw was one of my teammates on the ground with, with, with I think it was a Belgian, led on top of him because he, he you know, I won't use his language, but it was still, <laughs> he was explaining to the Belgian that he wanted to get, get him to get off of him. <laughs> when we got to the top of this cobbled climb, the cobble stopped and they had tape between the trees and we rode dirt across through the forest oh. until we got to the other side. Now, one of my other teammates had, was, uh, by now had, was up with me. And as we went over the top, he went past me. And I thought, you realize that when we go down that slope, it'll be another right hand onto the road. And he didn't. He went tearing off down here with a Frenchman. Well, as I got to the bottom, he, him and the Frenchman were picking themselves out of the ditch <coughs> with the Frenchman not very happy and two bent bikes. Oh. But anyway, off we went. I got cramp. So I was not too happy about that, and, uh, and therefore I lost a bit of contact. And it's at this point that I think I have to say that I think this is where Fat Albert, who was our, who ran the Café Den Engel in Ghent, where the, where we were with his, his mother's uh, cafe, I think he'd Mickey Finn my drink. The reason I say that is. The night before, he said, leave me your bottles, he said, and I'll fill them up for you. Now, to be honest with you, bear in mind that I probably only wanted either tea or coffee a bit tea or water. Why should I allow somebody to fill my bottle? Mm. I mean, I, I was, you were green. We, yeah. I, was a, I was a young lad, to be fair. I'm not making excuses. I'm sure he's put something in my drink. Uh. The long and short of it was, I got back up to where, whoever was in front of me, and the, one of our lads, I think he was from Leicester, he was... He was six foot 48. He was huge. <laughs> All I could see was legs when I wrote. And we literally, between us, we agreed that he would pound them on the flat. And every time there was a cobbled slope, I would get in the middle of the cobbles and give them. And, it, and Fat Albert was in the cars on the other side shouting at me to attack and attack, which seemed, I nearly said to him, look, if you want to keep shouting at me, you ride the bike. <laughs> we came into Ghent, uh, sorry, to Vavogham. Uh, and did the usual, or what was a circuit at the time before we went under the banner. By now, the Belgians were, were sort of looking at you because we obviously were giving, giving them all sorts of rubbish. And I thought, I thought we had them beat. As we came in for the sprint finish, I realised that we hadn't had them beat as, as usual. They, they, they were up for the sprint. <laughs> the three, three riders next to me collapsed into one another like dominoes. And I was the next one. And I could hear and see the blood going up the road. Oh. And I rode straight into the crowd. And they, I didn't, I stayed upright and they pushed me back into the thing. By then, of course, the, the field had gone. But anyway, that was, that was my Ghent paper gun. And it's at this point, and you may need to, to, you may need to, or want to remove what I'm going to say now, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> This is, a, this is a very sad thing for me. Tom had ridden the professional race and came sixth in Ghent Overgum. And he stood in front of me and I was only a green lad and there was just me and him. And he, I, I said, what's that Tom? And he took something out of his pocket and he, I could see his hand now. And he said, it's the insurance policy, John. And I said, what do you mean insurance? But I was green. Insurance policy. He said, if I'm in the lead, he said, 10, 10K out. He said, that's make sure I get there. I'd had some lovely times with Tom and Helen. I mean, we'd, we'd gone training. By the time we got in, well into the time with Tom, the squad shrunk dramatically. There were lots of bike cleaning, other things to be done. People not feeling good. And I remember one day, Tom said, I want to go down to Roubaix to get some money. He said that he'd won at the board, he had to collect it at the border. So there was just Tom and me and two lads from up north, Benny Dobson and I forget the other chap's name. And we set off to, to ride down to Roubaix. And um, I always think, because Tom and I were riding, we, 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 we paired up the other two lads, you know, and I'm sure, as you know, half wheeling is, and, we were, and it was started snowing it was that time of year and we were getting near to Roubaix and Tom suddenly said, I said, ah, I said, come on, I said, I'll, I'll go down another day. Now, whether he didn't like riding with me 
or what, whatever. I don't think it was. But anyway, we de- he decided we wouldn't bother. So we, we were almost at Roubaix, but didn't bother. So we went back and we went, and he said, go and get your, 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 your showering kit, he said, back at the cafe and come back to where he lived in Panzer Skipstrat. He was living in a, I think it was a builder's yard. Uh, I think the builder had was obviously a keen enthusiast, and, and that's where that's where Tom and, and Helen were were were, were, were living. It, it wasn't a, he wasn't living in the yard, but it wasn't exactly a glorious but but convenient place. But it yeah. was it, you know. So we went back, and I always remember how we were sat there. We, we showered, and Tom had a shower room, so we all literally stripped and went in. The and I also. I mean, I, I wasn't exactly Mr. Universe, but I thought, gosh, Tom, you know, I mean, he was back plasters, knee plasters. And, and I thought, is this man ever going to win the Tour de France? <laughs> you know, it, he, he just gave no speed, maybe, but certainly Tour de France. But I, I, I never thought he'd win the Tour de France. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so we were there having, uh, he said, come on, we'll have, a cup, we'll have some tea and whatnot. So we were sat there and Helen came back in with, with a cake on a plate. And there were already some cake missing, you know. It, obviously. So she cut a piece of cake off, put it on a plate, gave it to Tom, and went back out with the cake. Now you can imagine we were living on horse meat, rice, and you know this. Well, whatever it was at the, at the cafe. Yeah. And and Tom saw my face, and it's, it's the first time that I ever sensed what Tom always said to me. I'll explain later, but he said, "That's mine." And he was quite positive. So that's mine. He said, nobody else has that cake. Uh-huh. And I remember when we were out riding or training or whatever it was, I remember him saying, he said, you've got to be, he said, if you want to make it in this game, he said, you've got to be absolutely ruthless. And that cake spelt it for me. That that was his cake. Uh, I went down with, um, I suppose, very heavy, cold, whether it was a reaction to the, time or with the squad or whether it was the drugs so I got a feeling something had been put in my bottle because like I said I almost felt a bit like the the man from the Munsters with the bolt through his neck you know <laughs> so, so 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 whether it was in, in, encouraged by fat over it putting something in my bottle I don't know I have a feeling it was knowing now the back history of what Tom because whilst I was sat with Tom that day he said look he said, he said and he went and got a suitcase and opened it up and that was his vitamins. And he said, I go to go to Italy once a year to, to, to get these. And I thought, you come home to England and probably one of the finest places to get vitamins is England. Yeah. So why do you go, uh, you know, looking back, I, mm. I, I, not at the time, it, it didn't register. I, I never finished the Tour of Flanders. I ended up in the, in the wagon. Simply, I, start, I shouldn't have started. My chest was full of rubbish and I was, uh, you know, I a great disappointment because obviously Tour of Flanders, everybody wants to ride the Tour of Flanders. But anyway, didn't finish. Came home and my father said, um, I said, absolutely brilliant, Dad. And he said, do you want some more money to go back and have a go at it, you know? And I didn't tell him about what I've just told you. I simply said, no, I said, I, I, I think I'll, I'll stick here for a while. Yeah. Something like that, and left it at that. 